At any rate, so Broadnax here with Stager Talk, and I am joined today with Alice Chan. We hope that Adrian Lord is going to join us. She's having some technical issues right now, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Alice, my friend, how are you? I'm fantastic. With Alice Chan, we hope that Adrian Lord is going to join us. She's having some technical issues right now, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Alice, my friend, how are you? I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. With Alice Chan, we hope that Adrian Lord is going to join us. She's having some technical issues. Right okay, now, so Alice, do you have another window open on Facebook? Because we're hearing echo. Uh oh. Did you close that now? I think so. Okay. Oh, yep, yep. You got it. You closed the window out. So, God, we go back way back. I've known you forever. Yes. I started my staging business in 2003. So it's been 15 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just I remember I remember Santa Rosa I think it was yes it was yeah, Santa Rosa it was Santa Rosa right that was a really good venue I really like that place I love the Santa Rosa area it's so cool Northern California I'm so excited because it's sunny today I'm kind of over the whole rain thing so it's the weather's warming up this is it's spring finally yay <laughs> yep for sure uh, and your daughter. Can you believe she's 12? I she's can. going on 13 this year. This is ridiculous. It's insane it because insane. I had her and I would carry her in her little, when she was born, I would take her in her little carrier and bring her into the job site when she was still young enough and can be in the job site without making a fuss. And I set her on the side, do my work, check on her every so often, feed her and get back to work. I mean, it was, it was short lived, obviously, but it was, I can still visually remember all of that. <laughs> yep. And it's just so neat with social media these days, because it's like, I feel like I know her because I mean, I knew you before I saw you when you were actually pregnant with her. And it's like almost 13 years later and we've watched her grow up and she's so accomplished and so well put together. I mean, she really is well put together kid. Seems very well rounded with the gymnastics and everything. And then you've just done a really good job. Oh, thank you. I feel very, very lucky and blessed for sure. Yeah. You're definitely one of the, uh, the people, you know, when you look about women in business and I'm a big supporter of women in business and want to see, um, everybody hold on. I'm getting a text from Jacqueline and I can't oh, no. see it here. Hang on. Do you mean for you and Alice to be small? No, I don't Jacqueline. If you can oh, hear no. me, I don't know how to fix that. So I guess we're still having technical problems on this. Is so, there a way to make it bigger? I don't know. I'm afraid to click on anything because I don't want to disconnect anybody. Um, but we want it, want it big Jacqueline. So figure out how to make that happen. That would be awesome. Cause I know if I, turn my screen share on, uh, that's not going to do it, but I have no idea why it's showing up that way. So it's quite interesting. And we're sorry, I can't open up the chat. Every time it opens up the chat, everybody, uh, on my end, it completely uh, just echoes. So we're not gonna, I can't figure out how to be able to take questions. So just stay on and um, maybe if you have them, Jacqueline can text them to me if she hears me. Um, but at any rate, what I was saying, uh-oh, we just disconnected Alice. I'm there here. She is again. Okay. So what I was saying, Alice, is you're definitely one of those women. And I love to support women in business. And I love to see women having it all. And you are just, you have it. it you appear to have it all. <laughs> well, I'm glad I am fooling all of you. <laughs> fool, fool us all. But you are, you've got the great business. You're a wonderful mom and you see it. And you're really well put together and well spoken. And over the years, you've really been able to take your business from, like you said, just starting out in 2003. We've seen you uh, be on HGTV. Uh, you've been a host. Your work's been featured. Um, you were on Power Broker. That was. Was. So that was you, an experience. <laughs> was an experience, I bet. So we've seen you grow in all this. What's the secret to having it all? You know what? I'm going to be perfectly honest. I don't have it all. It's been a struggle. The struggle is real for sure. Um, I had a hard time going from building my business and um, having a thriving business. My staging business took off like a rocket 
and it was fun. And then I got pregnant and I had my baby and I was one of those people. I was like, my baby is going to adapt to my lifestyle. I am not changing anything I'm doing. This kid's just going to sit in the box van with me and we're just going to go all over the place and do what we need to do. And the reality is that's not real life. You know, that just, it doesn't work like that. You know, the, yep. all of a sudden your life like takes a, you're, you press the brakes because it's all about the baby. And that, that was hard initially to figure out what to do. And you just have to flex with things. And it was um, a rocky road at times trying to balance life as a mom, uh, which is challenging at best initially. And then also balancing a business because I could no longer just leave early in the morning and go to meetings and stay out all day and stay out all night, come home and, you know, as we are all solopreneurs at some point, you do all the work in the evenings and then you're out on job sites during the day, right? So exactly. when you have a newborn, it doesn't work like that. Um, and that was a tough pill to swallow. I tell everybody like, that was so hard for me, but that's why I kind of transitioned my business from, oh, look at that, we're big. <laughs> um, yes, I transitioned my business from, staging to more of the interior renovation. Uh, I was doing that with my clients because as you know, it goes hand in hand. You have a home, you stage it, you bring in the props, you make it beautiful. And what I felt was a little bit lacking was once you stripped away the props, what did you have? And I really wanted to create more value in the property for the homeowners. Once you took away the staging, that you still had a really nice house and the buyer still felt like they got a lot of value. And it wasn't just lipstick on a pig. It wasn't just, you know, we bring in pretty um, pictures and pillows and um, make that look nice for photos. And then when it's over, you still have an ugly house, you know? And so I was doing little by little, changing flooring, um, changing out old light fixtures, making all the appliances match. You know, you've gone into homes where, you know, people just bring in like, oh, we have a black stove and then we have like this almond refrigerator and we have this stainless steel piece that they got on sale. We got to make it all cohesive. Right. Um, and so I really enjoyed that because to me, it created a better package for the homeowners and also for the buyers. And so it started very small and it just kind of grew. And um, I just I just love it. I, I enjoy this part of the business uh, more so than the staging. And actually now when I work with resale properties, I outsource the staging. I, I don't do that piece anymore. Wow, that's interesting. We were talking earlier because I'm thinking about putting my house on the market and the kitchen. I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I don't know what they were thinking. In 1989, this countertop was not popular. I don't know why they put it in, but literally where I live, it's everywhere. And, and, it, and it's in my house, it's never been updated. Um, it is what it is, but the um, I need to change it. You know, I know that we need to do this and I get kickback from my husband and saying, why are we putting all this money into the kitchen? And I'm like, well, kitchen sells homes. Mm -hmm. Eliminate people's objections to your house by making some of these upgrades, especially if it's really dated and it needs to be done. You know, if you already have granite countertops, you know, and they work, then obviously you're not going to change those out. But for us, it was, you know, the square beige tiles with the brown grout. Mm -hmm. It had to go. To clean, aren't they? <laughs> horrible. We got Adrian joining us. So I'm going to keep talking while she's logging on here. And uh, so at any rate, how is it? I know for me, just, hi, Adrian. Can you hear us? I think she's, she's getting, getting there. there. She's getting there. <laughs> she's getting there. So how is it about overcoming objections with clients and doing that? Because I know I've had a hard battle with my husband and I'm the wife, so I win, but by default, but in real life, how is it um how is it in the real world of what it is that you're doing with um, overcoming these objections to people not wanting to put the money in? You know, I think more and more folks are realizing that the more they provide in terms of value in their properties, the more they're going to get back in return when it comes to the sale price. Um, and, and I've worked on a lot of 
older homes. As you know, in California, there's not a lot of new homes anymore and people are buying fixer uppers. Um, and they're realizing that if they put a little effort into the property, it's going to gain them so much more return on their investment. So 1980s properties yeah. and older has all very similar. I can, anything. I can hear you, Adrian. We hear you. <laughs> Yeah, 1980s properties and even older, they all have similar characteristics. You know, all the builder basics, um, they just don't cut it anymore. You know, people are looking for solid surfaces. They're looking for more modern features in a property, whether it be with your appliances, with lighting, you know, all those fluorescent light boxes. I don't know how many fluorescent light boxes I've taken out of properties. So we completely yeah. remove those and recess lighting, which is what people need today. And LED lighting, because that's what's going to be more efficient for energy. Um, there's so many things that depending on the price point of the property, we need to make sure that we update it to make sure that it's going to be in line with the price point that they're trying to sell it for. So we can't treat every property the same. And that's what sometimes people don't understand that if you have a $500,000 property, it's going to be a little bit different than your million dollar home and your multi-million dollar home. You need to make sure that the finishes in the home is in line with that price point. There's going to be similar principles. You want to be able to update lighting and flooring and paint and all of that. But the types of finishes will have to flex with the price point that your home is in. Yeah, absolutely. Adrian, can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> I know Jack, Jacqueline is texting me right now and she's saying, if I open the chat, I need to mute the video and the chat screen. So if we want to just, I'll take a second here and try to get the chat on. Uh, Cause every time I do it, we have this big echo. So hang on one second. I'm going to try to do it. And then she's saying mute the video once it comes on. I think that's it. But where's the chat? Oh, there's the chat. Oh, I get it. Okay, interesting. I'm on. Okay, I think that's it. Everybody can still hear me, right? I can. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So Adrian Lord has joined us, and I will say Adrian <laughs> is from Florida. We've had technical difficulties this morning. Always second time using the system, so we're going to get better. But it is quite comical for everybody. Sorry, to watch <laughs> us do this. Oh, last last week it was just horrific. Uh, welcome. Thank you. How are you? I'm I'm fine. Sorry to be tardy, but I'm now engaged and paying attention. So <laughs> no worries whatsoever. Uh, so we were just getting acquainted with Alice. Alice and I go way back. Um, God, we've known each other since 2002, 2003. Um, so we were just talking about, uh, you know, a little bit of the, the remodeling aspect when you are mm -hmm. staging the home. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about putting my uh, house on the market soon. And we were talking about, you know, with my husband, trying to get him to understand even, look, mm -hmm. the, the four by four beige tiles with brown grout, wasn't popular in 1989. I don't know why anybody would have ever used it, but they did. It's here and it needs to be <laughs> murdered and changed <laughs> out. And so that's what I've been dealing with. Um, what's your thought on the on, on, on actually doing some meaningful things that will actually increase the value of the home right before you sell it? Well, it's it's timely that you ask that because um, I am actually listing my house May 1st. Oh, so wow. I'm going through this whole flurry of activity. <laughs> <laughs> myself and I of course you know and, I, and I'm not the uh, the ideal customer I'm not I'm trying to eat my own dog food you know and do do what the stager is telling me to do so um, but we are doing uh, exactly some of those things taking some uh, you have to be cautious you don't want to overspend but there are some right. basic things that you can do that will give you quick impact um, I believe uh, for particularly the wet areas so kitchens and baths so we've, we're updating all of our lighting fixtures, for example, and our faucets, things like that, updating those um, is an example of some quick ways that you can refresh uh, a bathroom uh, that for a low cost, painting the cabinetry versus having to rip it out. That's another example of something that you could paint the cabinetry, update some fixtures um, and paint it a lighter color. And then all of a sudden you've got a refreshed looking bathroom. 
Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. I'm using, I'm doing my kitchen. And so mm -hmm. did the LG High Max from Lowe's. Yep. And uh, stainless steel sink and a new mm -hmm. faucet. And uh, all the rest of the appliances were going from black to stainless because they were mix matched when we got here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll get rid of the blood red walls soon as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm using the granite transformations on the cabinets and I love it. Oh, on the countertops? No, on the cabinets. Oh, okay. Granite, granite? transfer, grant, or sorry, not granite, cabinet transformations, Rustoleum, oh, okay. the Rustoleum brand. So it's a paint on product. Um, and awesome. I absolutely love it. Ooh. I love it. So are you having, are you hiring a stager? Is that what you said? Well, I have four stagers on my team. So I am <laughs> going to, I'm going to leave town for two days and say, have at it. Yeah. <laughs> That's my yeah, plan. Smart. I, I, I can't do it. I was telling Alice that when I sold, um, when I sold my first house that I went and stayed with it myself mm -hmm. and my agent come over and it's Terry Lynn Fisher. And she, I said, I'm so excited. Look what I did. And she's like, when could my stager come? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes no, she, we can't be objective in our own spaces. Okay. Yeah. And I literally, when, once he came in and did his magic and I came back, I was like, Oh my God, I never would have thought of it that way. <laughs> That's a really good idea. Yeah. So I'll be doing the same on this house as well. Mm -hmm. I'll be bringing somebody else in. Um, to deal with that aspect of it. Cause I definitely want to get top dollar. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about, um, Risa con. So we were talking with Alice already about, uh, she's going to be talking about the renovations project mm -hmm. management. So everything that I'm doing right now is what Alice does to properties mm -hmm. and uh, for her business model. So she's going to teach people about that. And you're going to teach people about the language of realtors. Mm -hmm. How do, are you going to be able to shed some light on how to get through and, how to get some of these stagers to be able to effectively communicate this? Well, I certainly hope so. That's the, that's the premise. So I think we kind of have uh, two things going on. One is we're going to spend some time talking about um, a survey that's going to go out April 1st. Um, we'll, you'll see more about that from Risa um, that we'll hope that we'll have a lot of agent participation nationwide where we're going to ask some very pointed questions. Um, and the biggest question we want the answer to is why? Why do you use staging or unfortunately sometimes why do you not? And what are the reasons so we can get in their head? So that's kind of half the presentation. And then the other part of the presentation um, at Risa Khan is going to be about um, speaking their language, understanding the transaction, understanding the pressure and what motivates, what makes a, an agent, a successful agent tick and how to kind of get in with an agent. Um, at the end of the day, stagers can, um, really get a, a relationship with half a dozen medium to top producing agents. And that could be your livelihood. You don't have to have, I've got 8,000 agents in my market. I don't, I really don't need 8,000. I need six to eight consistent agents. And that's, that's my livelihood. I mean, at the end of the day, and I'm, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's an extreme example, but you get the, the point. We don't need yeah, to market absolutely. to 8,000. You need to market to the ones that, uh, you know, develop your farm area, basically think like a realtor does and market just the way an agent does. And, and instead of your farm area being homeowners, it's agents. It's, it's realtors. absolutely, I agree with that more. And I think a lot of stagers also get hung up on the fact that they do want to cast this big net, the shotgun effect. And when they're doing that, they're getting onesies and twosies from agents. And that's why they mm -hmm. think that they need 30, 40 clients. And it's like, if you've got 30 or 40 clients, they're giving you onesies and twosies. And that's not what you want. If I was going to run a staging business, because I do this full time, I would want to be like uh, the team, everybody collaborate on the same team. So you have the agent, you have, you know, the same stager on the team, you have your mm -hmm you know, handy people, your craftsmen, and everybody's working together. So it's a collaborative effort. Yep. And those are the people that you want to focus on. But a lot of stagers get hung up on this agent didn't call me back or I didn't find this one. Don't worry about them. Weed through them. Great. You, It's like kicking them out of the toy box, you know, get them out of there so you can get to the ones that you want mm -hmm. and focus on those. So I think that's really good advice too. When I first started my business, I was very strategic about who I wanted to partner up with. I didn't mm -hmm. want to work with everybody. So right. I made it a point to research who were the top agents in my area, who were the people, and it's not as prevalent anymore, who were the people that had signs on every single lawn in the area. And I wrote down those people and I specifically went to the, um, the, the weekly meetings 
and went to their open houses and yep. spoke with them. And that's how mm -hmm. I got my business to start so quickly is I partnered up with agents who had mm -hmm. multiple listings. We're not talking about onesies, twosies. These are people mm -hmm. that are top producers. They're doing 30, 40, 50 homes a year. And so therefore they're able to give you consistent business. Now yep. you don't have to put all your eggs in one basket, but at the same time, you want to work with people who has the book of business that can help support your business. Yep. Absolutely. And, and we'll talk about hungry too, that you, a, a younger yeah. agent, even mm -hmm. if somebody's just starting out that they might be that, but if they're hungry, don't, mm -hmm. I see a lot of people get hooked up with um, agents that are doing it as a hobby. They're doing their own just, you know, eh, whenever yeah. I can get something to do it. It's like, that's not your, that's not your ideal client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and if so, you're being really honest, you figure that out pretty quickly. And mm -hmm. if you're just kind of hanging on because you just want somebody's business, you're shortchanging yourself. Yeah. Adrian, jump yeah. in. We've both cut you off twice. No, so, of course. Okay. so you may be surprised to hear that. Um, and, and I really feel like just like with agents, they kind of have their own brand and they can't be all things to all people. I think the same for stagers um, mm -hmm. is I know what my brand is and I know who my ideal customers are. And for me, I found that um, I started out with, I'm going to go to the top 10, 15 agents and, and guess what? Sorry, in our market, they usually won't even return our calls. It's the person, it's that 80% agent, it's that the guy that wants to be number one. Okay? He's still a top producer, but he's not on every billboard. So he's, he's hungry and he wants that. Partner with them and show some specific you know, data driven success stories in areas where he's already farming to say, all right, I see you've got these listings. Here's one that we did that, you know, it's comparable to yours that sold in 48 hours, you know, give him some data because he's the guy that wants to be the number one agent. He's, he's the guy that wants to be on the billboard. Um, that's the guy that will, in my experience, will partner with you all day long because yep. the, the light bulb will go off for them. Yeah. Hungry people. That's yep. that's what makes it. Hey, mm -hmm. Paula Bullard is watching us all the way from the Netherlands. I think she's there right now. Um, <laughs> hi, Paula. She says hi to both of you. Hello. Hello. Actually, said she said, tell it. <laughs> tell it, lady. <laughs> <laughs> tell it, lady. Um, now, Alice, you have a um, I think you're known for it's handled. It's handled. It's I handled. am your Olivia Pope. OK. <laughs> Tell us, uh, tell us about about that because it's it's a philosophy, it's integrity, and it's the way that you live your life in your business. Tell everybody about what that means. Well, unfortunately, we've all heard those horror stories of renovations that just drag on and on and on for small things. We're not even talking about a full house. I mean, honestly, I have done full home renovations in as little as six to eight weeks. No joke. That's what I'm known for. That's why people come to me because I will have a house crawling with trades and we are going to get it done because, and I'm not saying that we do that for every single home. It just depends on what the um, outcome expectation is, right? If you're putting it on for resale, if it's a, an investor property, whatever the case may be. Um, but so many times, I hear about renovation projects just drag on and on. And that's just not okay with me because I've been on both sides. I've been the homeowner who has undergone the renovation and it's not fun. Right. I've been on the side of the stager and I understand how realtors feel when they're trying to get a property on the market. They don't have time to waste. They want it done and they want it on the market. They want to capture specific selling seasons. And so that's what I'm here for. I'm here to make things happen. I'm here to finish projects quickly um, because on both sides of the equation, people want you in and out. They want to get on with their lives, whatever that entails, whether they're living in it or they need to sell it. Um, there's no reason for anything to take as long as sometimes they do, other than the fact that they're not prepared. Um, they don't have somebody overseeing it because we know Trades are not always going to show up if somebody isn't keeping tabs on them, unfortunately. And that's my life. Like every morning I'm on the phone checking in with who's supposed to show up at what job site. And every afternoon I'm checking to see what's happened. I'm on them all the time because that's the only way to ensure that things just drop off. You're, you're, a, trade, you're a trade nanny. 
<laughs> I'm a, I'm a full time babysitter sometimes. You're a full time nanny. That's why we say I need a biz nanny. Somebody that's going to tell me, uh, you know, what's up next? What appointments you got to be to? Don't forget to do that. I totally need that. Hey, we got a question coming in. Uh, so we got JS Tillery is asking Alice, your business model is exactly the business model that I've planned: renovation, remodeling. But my target market is investors. Investors in her market understand that they need stagers but they don't understand that she can help with choosing the finishes and all the specs, uh, not just the staging. Any pointers to get them to get that she can also help with that? I think what you need to help them understand is you're not just there to make it look pretty. So yes, you can help them pull the finishes and all that, but there's a step beyond that is the whole project management aspect of it. Unless they can be on site all day, every day, and also be sourcing and purchasing and making sure that all of the material needs to be on site because that's another reason why projects are delayed is that we don't have the materials on site so that the trades can then install it that's a big problem because then you know everything with renovation is a domino effect if one thing isn't done you can't do the next thing and then you can't do the next thing right so then things get delayed and trades will show up if whatever they're doing is not available, they're on to the next project. And then it's gonna be a nightmare trying to get them back onto your job site. So yeah. where you can bring value is that you're gonna oversee the whole thing for them. You're gonna ensure that that timeline is going to be maintained and that people are showing up when they're supposed to be showing up. They're doing what they're supposed to do in the way that you designed it. So I'll give you an example. So many times, I don't know why, but when we design bathrooms, we want wall sconces at a certain height, right? To me, ideally, it's at 60 inches high. That's where it hits your face the best. I don't know why, but all these guys want to install these sconces way up high. Where, I mean, if I want sconces up here, I might as well just get a bath bar. There's no reason why it's up there. But if I'm not there to ensure that what the what I designed is actually being implemented and executed properly. You get a shit show. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not <to> be <laughs> oh my god, I could not agree more. I go to. I see lots of homes in in places, even in my own, where it's like you know a man did this, a tall person did this. I'm seriously vertically challenged, and it's like. Okay. You have to you have you have to have things at a certain level. That's really important. Yeah, I work with a lot of investors, and I actually have recently decided to add to my contract little things like here's an example. I tell them don't install towel bars. I put a I put in the contract how high the chandelier should be from mm -hmm. the floor, things like that, which should already be they should be aware of but those are things that can make your life a nightmare when you go into stage when you've got you know towel bars that are hung randomly or light fixtures that are you know like a chandelier that's this far from the ceiling <laughs> because well then we won't hit our heads i'm like there's gonna be a table underneath it it was an awful <laughs> moment for the contractor oh yeah it's like yeah. I, I've, had, I've had a toilet paper holder that was literally at eye height like what the hell you know? <laughs> What is that? It makes zero sense. And I, I actually stand at the door with the contractor and go, okay, tell me what's wrong with this picture. And they have no clue. Like what? It's there. And those are those little details that mm -hmm. is where I bring value because yep. I have the eye and I'm overseeing it so that making sure that all those little details are done properly. Not only on time, but properly. And then also I oversee the budget, which is my nemesis, right? Because everybody has a small budget, but big dreams. And so how do you fit all that in to that to make sure everybody's happy in the long run? And sometimes mm -hmm. you can't. I'm I'm super straightforward mm -hmm. and no nonsense. I'm gonna tell you straight up if you're smoking crack. Like that's not gonna <laughs> happen. <laughs> Like, there's no way this laundry list of things are going to happen um, mm -hmm. in, with such a tight budget. But that's also where I bring value is I'm able to squeeze a lot out of a budget because my feet are on the street. I know what's going to look good. I know what's worth its value. I have relationships with my vendors. I get better discounts. Um, I know where to go buy the stuff. And it's going to take them hours to source yeah, yeah, and then right. go out and buy it. I mean, it 
all of this, if I'm doing this full time, but you have a full time job and you're trying to do this full time, you'll go crazy. And then you'll never get it done on time. That's just the reality. Yeah. So yeah. to the person who wants to include this into their business model, it can that's how you sell yourself is that they, they can do it. It's just going to take them three times as long to get it done. So when you're an investor, you don't have time for that. You need to get in, get out so that you can turn around and flip it and get the next house. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yep, absolutely. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. I think I Dallas might need to turn down a tiny bit. Okay. I'm uh, also very uh, loud. <laughs> I'm loud too. Okay. Uh, so I know you can't get into it all today right now, but you will be covering like how to how to price for this. Uh, if you're adding the project management and design services, you're going to cover that pricing strategies at Resicon. I will give some guidelines, yes. Yeah. I will provide some guidelines. And obviously awesome. it's all going to depend on where you are in your business mm -hmm. and where like location wise, like every state is going to be different. There's some things that I can speak to, but honestly, I don't know what if what works in California works in Florida, let's say, or if it's mm -hmm. going to work in Illinois. So there's going to be those considerations, but I'll give you a general framework of how I got started, how I do things and what I recommend for people. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So Adrian, do you mm -hmm. think that uh, stagers should get a real estate license so they can learn the language and mm -hmm. have access to, uh, you know, the MLS and to all that back end information? Um, I think that's kind of situational. Um, for me, it's been helpful to have a license um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one big reason is because I do have MLS uh, at my fingertips. So I cannot just look at what I would see from a consumer's point of view on Zillow. I can really get the nitty gritty pretty quickly. I can also do a CMA so I can compare properties. Um, I also, in my market, it's important because I want to be able to get into the property through a super lot box, which is the realtor uh, blue lot box and not having that would be a disadvantage. So being able to get into the Supra lockbox as needed, that's, that's another reason that is, um, uh, for me, that's just, that's a convenience and it's worth the price of admission <laughs> to, to, to do that. How, however, you need to understand if you get a license, it's, um, it's how you position it to other agents because human nature is, hey, are you my competitor? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to come across as the competitor. So you have to very, um, I guess, delicately position yourself that, yes, while I have a license, I am a licensed Florida agent. I'm not actively out trying to get listings. I'm not doing listing presentations. I'm not trying to get your business. Um, and if you look at me and I, and I will tell people, I said, uh, this sounds really funny, but I'll even say, look at my business card. You can't see it here, but it doesn't even have my last name. That's intentional. So someone would have to know my last name to look me up on our Florida licensing site to figure out that I have a license. I mean, they'd have to work hard to figure that out. My staging site has nothing about the fact that I'm an agent on there. Um, and if you looked me up by my last name in our MLS, you would see I have no listings. So yes, I have a, a license, but if, if, if but it, that's the that's what can be problematic or an issue if you don't position it right is because right. So you got to be really strategic about it. Yeah. And yeah. for anybody who's uh, interested in super access, uh, some areas will allow some affiliates to get super access. If not yours, my market, <laughs> um, depending on where you are. And then some yeah. that have not, uh, I've been actually able to craft a letter uh, on behalf of Risa uh, to send it into them to get certain MLSs to allow stagers to be able to have the access. You know, you have to pay the fees and all of that, of course. Right. But if you're in an right. area where doesn't doesn't offer it and you want it, email me at HQ and uh, we'll craft something and see if we can get it done. We were able to do it in, I don't know, the NM state, Minneapolis or Minnesota. I don't know, St. Paul, is it St. Paul, Minnesota? Yes. In Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> I think it was Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Uh, that we were able to get it in two areas for them. So mm -hmm. that's on the Risa website as well. Just mm -hmm. a little shameless plug for the super <laughs> access. Because uh, yeah. that came up. It's important. I think that's one of the it's best very important. in the world. I mean, so you don't have to have mm -hmm. an agent meet you. You don't, I mean, you just yep. click and clack, clack, and you're in. Yep. And I love it. Yep. So, Adrian, tell us what else are some important things that you're going to cover at RisaCon? Um, we're going to, I mean, we want to talk about kind of, um, 
how you develop the relationship long term with agents to get, um, you know, and I really want to kind of change the dialogue. Um, there's only so many times that we can say your listing is going to sell for less. Oh, excuse me. It's going to sell for less time, but for more money. We, we say that over and over again. And I think I, I'm, I'm trying to change the dialogue with productive agents, um, which is you're going to use our um, staging and photography. And we also do design advice and, and use this package that we're offering you as a tool. And guess what the tool is all about, Mr. or Ms. Agent? It's to get more listings because that's the lifeblood of an agent is it's all about where am I getting the next listing? That's that's music to their ears. So how can you, you know, give that value proposition? And and so that's really going to be an important part of the discussion that we're going to have in July is um, if they all they ever hear is, oh, we're going to sell this listing faster. Well, that's great. We're going to sell it for more. That's great. How can I get you more listings? That's when they're going to start listening, I believe. So absolutely. What's in it for them? What's in right. it for them? With them. <laughs> With them. <laughs> it's funny about agents. I posted this morning about photos um, online. If you're marketing a horse property, you're marketing to horse people. Horse people live in a double wide so they can have horse property. Right, they care right. more about what the barn looks like than the inside of the house. So post right. some pictures, stage the outside of the area. Like for me, I'm looking for horse property. There's great horse, great horse property. It's got all the verbiage in it. Not one picture of the barn or the outside. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking, I think you should stage the inside. I think you should stage the outside and post pictures of them. Agents out there. Super <laughs> important. Um, I would love to see the day where agents are making the move. And I'm sure there are out there. I don't know one personally, but won't take a listing unless it's staged. I, I, I know that. several. Do you? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I think that's just, <laughs> if I was going to sell real estate, that would be my business model. Because why... It's like homeowner, you're tying my hands. This is merchandising your number one asset. This is no different than products on the shelves or Jaguars or whatever it may be. It's just, it's just common sense. You've got yeah. to make this product. You want the most for it when you're going to sell it. You have to shine it up and you have to make it look good and you have to fix what's wrong with it and yeah. eliminate all those objections. And it's just such a no brainer. I would think that uh, more people would be on board with it. I have seen obviously we've seen over the last decade, a, a huge push for staging. It's becoming much more readily acceptable, but I would love to see those business models. So how's it working for your agents that do that? Um, so in our market, um, like I, I've said, there's approximately 8,000 agents, which is mind boggling. Um, and the average homeowner that wants to list their house is speaking to between three and five agents. And so what I tell the agents that I partner with is be disruptive, be different. They're all saying the same thing about, I'm going to be at the top of the list of Zillow. I'm going to do a video for you. I'm going to send postcards and, you know, blah, blah, blah. 99% of the agents are doing that. But if you come in and say, this is my portfolio of houses and what they look like and how quickly they've sold, because you've got a track record. And here's what, you know, when you look at this house, you can tell it's my listing. And if you want to get on this train, like this is what we do, then that's great. And if you don't, I understand, but they have that kind of uncomfortable conversation, if you will, very early in the game at the listing appointment. Yep. And sometimes, you know, they end up shaking hands and walking home and say, and not getting the listing. Um, and, and I have an agent that I work with who doesn't take listings unless they're staged and I'm a stager. Um, and he says that about 30% of them, he knows at the listing table when they're very adamant that I'm not going to take down my family pictures and I'm not going to, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. He just says, you know, then you don't really fit in the model we're looking for. And there are two things I don't do is one, take an overpriced listing or two, um, work with a homeowner that won't stage. But we do wish you well. And then sometimes about 48 hours later, they call because I've now interviewed their other three to five agents and they say, you're the only one that told me what I needed to hear. And, and I actually take it a step further. Sometimes I'll go with him on listing appointments and I'll give them stories of properties that didn't stage at the beginning and then came to us after listing expired. And then we staged their house. None of those homeowners said, I really wish that my agent had just kept lying to me. Mm -hmm. And I actually right. say that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, and I said, because they had six months of misery because their agent didn't say things like, 
for the love of all that is holy, take down that picture, take down those drapes, whatever it is, they wouldn't have the, un so instead of just pulling the plug, making it an uncomfortable conversation once, pull the, pull the bandaid off one time, and then let's move forward merchandising the property. So sometimes we have those kind of conversations early in the game, get it over with, everyone gets on the same page. Yep, absolutely. I think it's brilliant because it's like, this is, this is my business model. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. Everybody stages, they all sell. My stats yep. are amazing. And mm -hmm. if that doesn't work for you, great. I can refer you to another agent. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Just plain and simple. Melissa also commented as well is that uh, when you say that you won't take the listing because they won't stage, suddenly the customers want you even more. Mm -hmm. And so that, that pairs with what you were saying really nicely. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and now, Alice, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the main points that you're going to make at Resacon. Well, the main point is that most stagers are probably doing some level of what it is I'm going to be talking about um, with their clients. And you're doing things on a smaller scale. And let's see how we can kind of expand that a little bit and add additional revenue to your to your income, um, to your business. Um, it's you know, I've done the whole staging thing. And as we all know, mm -hmm. staging is a high overhead business. Um, and I want to help people kind of reduce that if they can. And then if this is something that they enjoy and it's not for the faint of heart, it requires somebody that is um, that is not afraid to speak up, that can work with a lot of men because the trades are a bunch of dudes. And there is going to be guys that talk to you like you don't know a single <laughs> thing. I've been in this business for so long and I just sit there. And I listen to them sometimes talk to me as if um, I'm a child. And then I I don't say anything sometimes in front of them, or I will, because I'm not afraid to do that. Or I do my research after the fact and I go, what they said didn't make any sense at all. But because I'm female, I must not know anything about construction, right? And it's these are the things that you learn over time. Um, so definitely it, it takes somebody that is strong, that speaks their mind. You um, can handle spinning lots of plates in the air at the same time because every job site is going to require different things at different times and things are going to go bad. Um, and how are you going to handle that? Um, and, and that kind of comes with experience, just like with the staging business. There's things that come up with time that um, that come up in a job site at a project that you can handle five years into the business that you couldn't mm -hmm. handle your first year. Right. True, because it true. just comes with experience. You know what to do now. Um, and the same thing goes with renovation and design. But it's a, an an amazing business model. It doesn't require a warehouse full of inventory. Um, it does require great relationships though with mm -hmm. not only your clients, but with trades and having that trust and knowing who you can work with. Cause I've worked with a bunch of duds. It's like kissing a lot of frogs before you get to the people that you can trust and you can actually say, Hey, you know, I've got this job. This is what I need to do. You say it once they get it. Um, and I'm not constantly having to, um, stay on top of them. You still do have to, you know, oversee what's happening, but you're not having to, you know, hold their hand through everything. Like, why am I telling you how to lay this tile? Why do I have to tell you how to measure this shower so that you don't get this teeny weeny piece of tile on top and this big fat piece of tile on the bottom? Like you should be able to lay this out yourself. But um, we'll, we'll be talking about that. We'll talk about how to price, and how this fits into, and the different types of renovations, right? Because there's renovation for resale, which I think if you just get those types of clients, it's a lot faster and easier than mm -hmm. if you're doing renovations for someone who just purchased the property and it's a fixer upper and they want to redo the whole thing. Or um, if it's for an investor, because investors are constantly looking at the bottom line and it is challenging, you know, because you're, you're, you're balancing a lot of the, the needs and wants list with this little budget and what, how do we maximize that? Um, and a lot of it is pretty self-explanatory. It's kind of common sense, but at the same time, you also have to be strong in your opinion and um, how you execute because 
people are going to want everything done perfectly. They want everything changed. I'm working with a property right now where even the little things, there's not enough budget for it, but there's a refrigerator in the property, but they want to get a nicer refrigerator. Well, we don't have money for that. If we have a fridge, we're keeping that fridge. Um, they want to replace all of the plumbing valves. Not expensive, but every dollar starts to add up, right? Every $5 item, every $10 item starts to stack up to hundreds and then later thousands of dollars. You know, what? what's most important to do? Um, it's just like when you're going into a property, you know, which rooms do you need to stage if they can't stage the entire house? What's gonna give you the biggest impact? What's the, what's the biggest bang for your buck? Um, knowing how to figure that out and, and present it to your clients so that they understand I'm here to help you get the biggest return on your investment. Yep, absolutely. I love that. Are you going to cover a little bit about how to vet your tradesmen? Because that's, it struck a chord with me what you said about, you know, if, if they're not even tiling correctly, because you don't know what you don't know. So how do you vet somebody so you don't get the wrong team on one of your first projects, then it goes horribly wrong, ends up costing more money. So are you going to cover anything about how to, properly interview? How do you know the people that you're hiring are really all that in a bag of chips and are going to be able to do their trade? And I guess it's a lot about the integrity. When you meet somebody, you need to know that they care about their business. So I guess a, a lot of it will be about even how they present themselves. Yes. And it's hard because there's some people that talk a good talk, man. Right. They can sell you all day long. I have a tile guy that I can think of right now. Like he knew exactly what to say, how to say, it, but when it came down to it, I don't know the man knew what the hell he was doing you know like i don't know how many youtube videos he watched but he was good at selling his service man <laughs> and then when it came you know and it's hard because it's not like you could say oh can you give me a sample here you know maybe if you get an opportunity <coughs> with um people that they've worked with or if you sure. get a chance to see their work um that's very very helpful um and it's kind of trial and error, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, there's sometimes that you can figure out whether or not somebody is just totally BSing you, and then there's other times it really is uh, you just have to do a project with them and maybe not give them a big project, a smaller one. So if it turns out bad and you had to start from scratch, it wouldn't be so bad. Um, but yes, it, it's many years of just trying out people and learning and knowing how to talk to them and figuring out if they really know what they're talking about or not, um, you get a sense of that because you've done enough projects that if you ask them certain questions, you know if they know their stuff. Yeah. In addition, asking them what are their goals for their business? Because again, you want somebody to collaborate with. You want to be able to go to somebody and say, look, this is my business model. I need a, a a tile person to fit into my business model. Where are you in your business and what are you looking at for the types of clients that you want? Because I want to do, I don't want to just do one project with you. I want a re long standing relationship. Absolutely. Is that what you're looking for? Because some of these people don't want that. Right. They're hit and runs, you know, they just yeah. want to do a hit and run and they're it. Yeah. They're, they're just looking for the next paycheck. Some people, and I don't love that. And you know, it's tough because you're always balancing the types of folks that you can hire with the budget that you're given to work with. So um, I do a lot of things and it's totally going to be, you know, taboo, the stuff that I talk about, um, you know, do you do work with permits or not permits? Do you work with licensed versus non-licensed contractors? You know, it, it, there's so many variables that, um, come into play when you're working with any particular project and I present all of the options to the clients and it's ultimately up to them. But I've, you know, if you're working with non-licensed contractors and trust me, we're in California. This is like so hard because we have a really hot market here, particularly in the Bay Area. Do you know that the guys that hang out at Home Depot who no longer hang out there because they're all getting picked up bright and early in the morning, make $25 an hour. They make more money than if you worked a legit job because there's just such a shortage of laborers. Mm -hmm. And so it's a challenging thing when you're trying to work with people who um, need a lot done and they can't afford a construction company. Right. You know, so um, it, it's 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 tough. it keeps changing. And I'm 
And I'm just hoping, I don't want the economy to change, honestly. I mean, obviously I, I like it when things are thriving, but it sure makes doing business in our industry challenging because you've got lots of personalities and they know what the going rate is and they know what they can charge. And if you don't want to pay them, somebody else will. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. So Alice, this is your second time speaking at Resacon. It is. It is. Adrian, this is your first, correct? Yes. <laughs> We're going to break you in, do some damage with Adrian Lord from Florida. <laughs> what? Well, I think everybody are, they're going to absolutely love both of you. Uh, both of your sessions have so much value. Um, and uh, I, I think you're just going to be real assets to to the event. And um, Adrian, have you actually been to RisaCon before? Yes. Yes, how, you were. How, how quickly you forget. <laughs> it's been 17 seconds. My nickname is Dory. I will literally forget that we had this call this morning and when I leave in an hour. Um, yes, so, yes, I, I apologize. I, I have okay. to brain triage. I dump my memory dump. It's like, no, don't need that. I know who Adrian is. That's good enough. <laughs> so, this is going to be awesome. This year is going to be pretty epic. Um, we are uh, plugging along. We got Vern Yip coming in as uh, mm -hmm. one of our keynotes. And then we have Michael Michalowicz, who's the author of Profit First. He's going to be there as well. Um, all the speakers, all the sessions, really top notch. There's something for newbies. There's something there for middle of the road, wanting to take your business to the next level. And there's uh, more for the the uh, seasoned stager top producers that is there as well. So. I'm super excited about it. Uh, Homestating mm -hmm. Industry Awards are also coming. They're taking, uh, ex accepting submissions right now. Oh my God, I should have got my notes. I think it's April 16th. Again, you got the Dory <laughs> factor going on. And uh, April 16th, I think it's the last day to submit. So it's a self-submission. You have to submit your own work because you're the only one that has access to everything. So please check that out if you're on the fence. It's a really great marketing tool. We have top 10 lists that you can make as well as the overall winner in each category. Uh, we have lots of different categories, re redesign, occupied, uh, rising star for newbie stagers, and then the professional stagers for more than two years in business. Product and service award, too. If you've got a product or service that uh, helps in the staging industry, please go ahead and check that out. And then if anybody knows of an influential person in the staging industry, we are also taking uh, nominations. So you can nominate other people that are the top influencers because we're going to have the real estate staging industry's top influential people list that will be coming out. So we're really excited to see that. Uh, that category, you can nominate as many people as you want. There's no charge for you to do that as well. If you're on the fence about RisaCon, RisaConvention.com, early bird pricing ends April 2nd. So get your tickets now. Any final words for everybody? I want to look. <laughs> see, oh, there you go. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> Don't hate. <laughs> Love it. All I've got is my uh, my uh, clipboard behind me. That's it. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. But you got on. I'm logoing it up. <laughs> All right, ladies. Thank you for joining thank me. It was you. such a pleasure to see you both, and uh, we will see everybody this July at Resacon in Vegas. See you there. Until then, happy staging. Bye. Bye. Bye.